Hi, this is Jackie Sholomit with Sholomit Group of Cobo Banker here in downtown Palo Alto. And today we have the honor of having Ken Hayes, the principal of Hayes Group Architects, to tell us about everything that goes behind the scene to get the development for both uh, commercial, residential, or multifamily. And he's going to go through all those steps that he takes through their clients to from beginning to the end. So Ken, let us know okay. what do you have for us? Hi, Jackie. Thank you for this opportunity. Again, Ken Hayes with, with Hayes Group Architects. We have uh, uh, offices in Redwood City and in San Francisco, and we focus on projects in the local community, both residential, um, mixed use, residential and commercial, as well as uh, commercial projects in our, you've probably seen many in the downtowns. Um, so I just wanted to briefly talk about um, what someone should think about as they go about considering uh, purchasing land or buying a home. Uh, and I'll focus mostly on, on residential. Um, and what you might want to think about, uh, you know, as you go through that due diligence process um, with Jackie. Um, and one of the first things would be, you know, what, what is the zoning for the, for the property? Because the zoning can tell you so much about uh, what kinds of uses are permitted. And most of you probably will be looking at properties or homes that are single family and single family is the predominant use in most of our, um, most of our communities. But you wanna know about the zoning because you wanna know uh, what the allowable uses are and what the site development requirements are for the property. What can you do there? And unlike the building code, the zoning ordinance is different in every community. Um, and the building code, although there are some minor um, uh, amendments from local jurisdictions, the zoning code changes with every jurisdiction. So it always keeps us on our toes. So um, once you know that you can build your residential home or remodel the residential building that's there, you wanna think about what can I do? And so site development requirements are spelled out in the zoning ordinance of each community. And it talks about things that you've probably heard about. Building setback, building FAR, floor area ratio, how many square feet can you have on the property? What the height might be for the, for the building on the property? Are there daylight planes that could start to restrict what you might be able to do and how close you can build to the property line? Site coverage, how much of the site area can the building actually cover? Um, and whether you're allowed to have accessory buildings and what the requirements might be um, for parking. Um, most residential uses require two covered parking spaces, um, but you know that can vary. Um, can those spaces be tandem, one car in front of another, or do they need to be side by side? And the zoning ordinance will let you know uh, what the requirements are with regard to that. Um, you might also want to do some investigative work to determine whether the property you're buying is a legal non-conforming property. Um, it might already exceed some of the site area uh, requirements for the property. It might be an historic property that could have some restrictions in terms of what you can do because of the historic listing of the property. Um, but you know, even if it is an historic property or a non-conforming property, chances are you'll be able to do something with it. Um, we, we've been involved in a number of historic uh, building renovations, both commercially and, um, and residentially. And um, there are ways to work with the Secretary of the Interior's guidelines for uh, additions and remodeling to those historic properties. Nonconforming properties um, can be a little uh, challenging as well because um, it might be over the setback. The house might be over the existing setback. It might have too many square feet. And so you won't be able to add on to those properties but there are chances that you might be able to reconfigure the existing floor area within a footprint or something like that. Um, you might also want to inquire about fire sprinkler requirements. If you have a new building in California, I'm sorry, a new home, um, there's no choice. You need to install residential fire sprinklers. However, if it's an existing building, there may, you, have, you have some choices. You might be able to avoid installing the expensive fire sprinklers throughout the home depending upon what you want to do to the house. And so most jurisdictions regulate that by how much of the floor area or how much of the home are you actually modifying. Um, and depending on how much, usually like a 50% threshold, if you exceed that, it may push you into a requirement for fire sprinklers. You might want to install fire sprinklers anyway, um, just for peace of mind. Um, you might want to find out if the property is in a flood zone. 
Um, in Palo Alto, many of the properties are in a flood zone and you wanna find out what the base elevation, flood elevation is, and then work with the public works department in, and the planning department within that community um, to understand what those requirements are. Um, and FEMA gets involved in establishing those requirements and uh, there's not a whole lot of flexibility with them. So if you're buying or looking at a, par a property or an existing home in a flood zone, you wanna understand um, what that means um, to the redevelopment of that property. And again, there are equations that relate to how much are you affecting the existing structure to determine whether or not you need to bring that existing structure above the floodplain um, elevation. Um, many people would probably want to not have to go through that expense. So once you've worked with the local and the planning department will be the jurisdiction that you would work with primarily during this kind of discovery process um, of the zoning ordinance. Um, also with a design professional like myself, we, this is our expertise, this is what we do. But once you know what the constraints are, you can hire your design professional and work with them to develop, you know, your you know, work with your goals and objectives, whatever problem you're trying to solve and develop a concept for your home that again, now we're gonna go back once you have a concept for your home, you need to talk to the planning department about what the requirements are for getting that concept approved before you embark on hiring the rest of the design team and the engineers primarily um, and go through that expense because you wanna make sure that the home receives its entitlement before you embark on that next phase, um, which would be the construction drawing or what we call, let's say the permit phase and receiving the building permit. So every community again, unfortunately is different. Um, some communities have no, what we call design review. Other communities have a very onerous design review process that could take up to a year, um, depending on how sensitive the, the site is and what you're trying to do in order to get your property approved or your, your proposal approved. Um, that process will involve you hiring not only your architect, but a landscape architect, a surveyor, maybe a civil engineer, maybe a biologist and an arborist, a soils engineer, because the community is going, to, the jurisdiction is going to want to know um, whether um, the site is buildable, whether it's got adequate properly, you know, soil, whether there's um, earthquake faults nearby, or whether you're affecting certain vegetation that might be protected, um, like trees, uh, oak trees especially, or redwood trees in our community. Um, but the good news is, once you receive your entitlement and the project is approved from a planning standpoint you're free at that point to embark on the construction drawing phase. And the construction drawings are those drawings that you would prepare with your architect. There'd be some additional consultants that you would hire at this time. This is when we would talk to the structural engineer. This is when we would talk to um, energy uh, consultants to make sure that we're complying with energy requirements and meeting your goals for sustainability, for instance, uh, and, um, you know, and how, uh, how green you might want your home to be. Um, but anyway, the construction drawings would be the next step uh, on the way to receiving a building permit. And so once you've prepared the construction drawings, which could take several months, three, four months, perhaps, depending upon how complex your home is, um, they would be submitted to the building department for their review. And that review at the building department level could also take another three months before they would have comments um, for you and your design professional um, to address. Um, once those comments are addressed, then the city would uh, issue a building permit and you would embark on the exciting process of, of building your new home. So that's where, that's where this whole process ends, right? With the home being complete and, uh, and you're in and everybody is happy and um, the process can be very rewarding, but you have to realize going into it that it can be fraught with lots of roadblocks, lots, lots of uh, um, decisions that need to be made. Um, but in the end, the idea um, is that everyone is going to be thrilled to be living in uh, their new community in their new home. So um, that is sort of a really broad brush um, sort of outline of what you need to go through. And your design professional would be more than willing to talk to you in more detail about every step of the way. Well, the frequent questions that I'm always asked by the prospective buyers or even the homeowners are, uh, especially these days, about ADU. Can I build the ADU? How big of an ADU can I build? What is right. the process? How long would it take? How long is it from beginning to the end? On top of that, they ask me, what is the average 
you know, cost for design, permit, and construction. Yes. And, and we are actually working on a few ADUs currently um, in our practice. Um, because of the housing shortage that we're faced with in California, there's been a big push by our assembly to, um, to create laws that allow the construction of housing without having to go through the onerous process that I just outlined, or at yeah. least half that process, okay? So uh, everyone in California on a single family parcel that allows residential development is allowed to build an accessory dwelling unit, an ADU. Um, and state law prescribes certain, um, certain limits, um, certain setbacks, certain requirements for parking. And every community is supposed to put together their own ADU, um, let's say uh, site development requirements um, based on state law. And um, I believe it can't be any more um, restrictive. Um, and so state law kind of gives you, I believe about 800 or 850 square feet as a minimum size for an accessory dwelling unit. Um, it uh, gives you uh, um, some uh, leeway in setbacks. Um, it gives you leeway in floor area. So if the existing home currently maximizes the floor area that's allowed on the parcel, it typically doesn't matter. Um, you can still build um, an ADU. You can hook up to the existing sewer that serves the property, the existing electrical service. You don't have to have um, a separate sewer lateral. Um, and the biggest thing is it's uh, not subject to what we call discretionary review. So this process that I outlined earlier about, I just quickly touched on it, design review, and every community is different in how they approach design review, but it can be a 12-month process before you have your design approved. Um, that's because it's discretionary review. It's subject to everybody's opinion and a review board's uh, review of um, community concerns. Um, as well as their own. And uh, this ADU process uh, short circuits that. It's considered just ministerial review and so not subject to uh, the discretionary review. So it literally can go right to building permit. So you would hire your design professional. You still need to understand what the local requirements or restrictions are for an ADU and every community has now their new ADU ordinance. Um, but uh, you'll find that it's a much faster process um, getting to a building permit because you can bypass all the discretionary reviews along the way. Um, so that process would be, you know, you have to design the, the project with your design professional um, and uh, submit for a building permit. And so we know already that that's going to be at least three months once you submit for a building permit to get um, comments back from the uh, local jurisdiction. Um, and then you respond to those comments and they would issue a, um, a building permit. But to go through the design process uh, for your architect to prepare construction drawings, um, it's going to require um, you know, a bit of time. And so that you might be investing three to six months, depending upon you know, uh, what you want, um, how complex it is. Um, or how simple it is, um, but you know you should allocate probably for the whole process to start until you have your building permit. You're probably going to be looking at, you know, I'm going to I'm going to guess six to nine months, uh, depending on how quickly you can get through some of that. In terms of cost, it's all over the place. I mean, I don't see an ADU uh, costing any less than uh, what you're going to pay for a custom home. Now there are a lot of companies out there though that are building or that are marketing prefab um, ADUs. And so um, since you're not subject to discretionary review, um, that might be the route to go for some of you because it's not gonna be held to a certain design standard of the community. Um, and so you could theoretically put um, you know, a pre-packaged, pre-designed, prefabricated building that then just gets placed on the foundation um, that might exist. Um, if that's not for you, then you might be subject to a longer, a longer period and higher construction costs. So some of these pre prefabrication companies can offer, um, you know, offer their product at a lower rate than what you might pay a custom builder to build one for you. Um, but we're, you know, there, I don't want to scare people by construction costs right now. It's really an aberration where we are with material costs being sky high and kind of just starting to come out of COVID. Um, and in particular with all the fires in California, it is very tough to find a contractor. My advice going into it is that with your architect, you try to find a contractor right away. 
And that contractor then can work side by side as part of the design team um, and provide real time feedback on decisions that involve uh, costs that could help inform the process that you're going through, whether it be for the ADU or for your new home. Um, it makes sense to try to get a team together um, early on. So uh, they can be invaluable um, as a team member. Uh, and then you know that when you're ready to start and you have that building permit in hand, they've been involved and they would start right, you know, you have them committed already to your project. So we always like to recommend have them involved, involved early on as a team player. So that if a question. prospective, if a prospective homeowner wants to either build a new house or expand a house or even put an ADU and they come to you as their advisor, would you be in a position of also recommending several contractors to uh, to get the estimates from or uh, do they need to go out and find their own contractors? No, we, we typically like to be involved in that process. I mean, often uh, owners have gone through the process before and they do have a contractor that they trust and builds quality um, and they, you know, and, and they, they want that and they want that person involved. Um, if that's not the case, we typically would like to recommend at least three general contractors. Um, and as we start to generate ideas, we may just have, Let's say, for instance, we the drawings that go to the architecture review board or what we call maybe the ASRB in Woodside or something like that. We could take those drawings and with some initial engineering, a little bit more expense, but provide some engineering, uh, provide some uh, information relative to uh, specifications of materials and finishes. And we would send that package of drawings out to selected contractors that we would bring to the table and we would ask them all. Um, to put together a preliminary detailed estimate, we typically would provide the spreadsheet of the format that we're looking for so that when we get the information back, we're comparing apples to apples and the information is provided in the same format for easy sorting and comparison. And then what we do is we take those estimates and we develop our own cost estimate based on those numbers. And what you're gonna find and why you want three contractors um, is four is too many, two is not enough, Three is just perfect because at that stage in the process, you're going to see numbers that are kind of all over the place. You might have somebody that gives you a foundation number for $50,000, and you might have another foundation number that's 55, and you might have a third that's 75. And that happens in all the various scopes of work as you move down the list of item by item. And so we typically would throw away or throw out the aberration. So the $75,000 number you put off to the side and we would average the two numbers that are close together and move that over into our column of what we think the estimated cost of the foundation would be. And we do that for every line item, get to the bottom of the spreadsheet and we add a 15% contingency probably, a escalation factor because you're not going to be building maybe for a year. Um, so it's important to understand inflation. Um, and, and we would tell our client at that point, if you're willing to, I mean, this is, you know, this is probably where the cost is going to be. Um, and uh, now look at that and let's talk about which contractor you want to work with based on their qualifications and maybe what their fee is, what they're going to charge you for their profit and overhead and what they're going to charge you to run the job, which we call general conditions and everything else is subject to change based on their subcontractor bids. Um, and so we like the client to focus on the work the contractor does, the personality, can I work with them? And then we, at that early stage, actually, we are asking the contractor to commit to a fee and general conditions to run the job. And that's treated almost as a fixed bid. And we know everything else will potentially change with the market and with their subcontractor bids. But it would give the owner enough to bring that contractor on as a team player early enough on in the process that they could start to inform decisions that are made later. So that's how we approach it. This is so valuable information. Yeah. I'm sure our viewers have tons of questions that they would like to reach out to you and ask. So how, what would be the best way for them to contact you? Probably by email, um, our, but our, our office number, uh, we're still working sort of remotely. Um, I come to the office every day, but uh, my email is the initial K, Hayes, H-A-Y-E-S, at thehayesgroup.com. We also have a website, uh, www.thehayesgroup.com. 
Um, and uh, the phone number is 650-365-0600. And my extension is 115. All right. Appreciate that. Thank you thank so you. much, Ken. All right. I hope, I hope it helps your, uh, your clients. All right. So thanks for reaching out.